SM TV, Nashville. This is NBC Nightly News with John Chancellor and David Brinkley. Tonight, Monday, June 13th, reported from the NBC News Center in New York. Good evening. David Brinkley is on vacation. And James Earl Ray is back in his prison cell, facing a disciplinary hearing and possible Tennessee state charges for his prison break. He was run to ground by a pair of bloodhounds after 54 hours in the woody, wooded mountains near Petrus, Tennessee. Ray escaped with six others. Only one of them is still free. Mike Jackson reports from the Brushy Mountain Penitentiary. These are bloodhounds. They are taught to do only one thing, to track down human beings. For the three days and nights of the search, bloodhounds have sniffed their way through the mountains near the prison, following the freshest scents left by James Earl Ray and his fugitive companions. The dog handlers are longtime residents of the area. They hunt here, and they knew of places where the escapees could hide. About one o'clock this morning, they had their first success. They found Earl Hill, Jr., a murderer, Hill was James Earl Ray's cellmate. They were friends, and authorities said finding Hill was a major step toward finding Ray. They were right, but it took another hour of stumbling through the mountain fog and darkness. But about 2 o'clock, they found Ray. This subject coming in, is that the one we discussed just before you left? 101. That's 10-4, Gerndolf. Ray was driven directly to the prison and wearing his prison clothes, was taken to the dispensary. He was in good health, although tired and wet and muddy. He had not eaten since he escaped. Prison warden Stoney Lane said the dogs chased Ray for three hours before he got so tired he could not keep going. He was taken in custody in the woods. He had laid down, covered himself up with leaves, pulled leaves over him and uh, the dog team walked up on him and took him in custody. After sunrise, Ray was taken from the dispensary to a special maximum security cell block where he will stay until a hearing can be held to decide what to do with him next. Prison officials say they have not yet decided how to punish James Earl Ray for breaking out of the penitentiary last Friday. They say they could ask the state of Tennessee to prosecute him in which case the maximum penalty would be a year in prison in addition to the 99-year sentence he is already serving. Mike Jackson, NBC News, Brushy Mountain Penitentiary. Tennessee today asked the federal government to take charge of Ray's incarceration, and this afternoon the Federal Bureau of Prisons said cautiously it would consider the request. Ray's capture puts an end to speculation that authorities had deliberately let him go so that he could be killed for what he may or may not know about the murder of Martin Luther King. His escape was of interest to some members of the House Assassinations Committee. Ford Rowan was at the committee today. These are all things that we cannot say. Had Ray not been caught, one committee staff member said, we would have raised hell about the escape. Instead, the Assassinations Committee received a briefing from two investigators who visited Tennessee and who said there was no evidence Ray had received outside help in escaping. Over the weekend, three committee members suggested there had been an outside plot. Chairman Lewis Stokes said he feared Ray had been lured out to be Our silenced. Today he wasn't so sure. Well, I have no way of knowing what the full circumstances uh, are concerning his, uh, his having escaped. Uh, that is, uh, I still do not know whether or not he was a willful participant or whether he was uh, lured into it or whether uh, he saw an escape occurring and uh, jumped into it. We just have no way of knowing at this point in time. Ray has been interrogated five times by committee lawyers, but sources say his story has not changed from the one he's been telling for years. Ford Rowan, NBC News, Washington. Also on the program this evening, we'll see President Carter at his press conference this afternoon. Former Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark died today, and Edwin Newman will have some thoughts on that story. We'll have the latest from Holland on the Moluccan story, and we'll take a careful look at a movie which is doing better at the box office than any movie in history. Well, my Jeep CJ is the toughest rig around. My Jeep CJ can take yours anytime. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Here in Jeep country, 
This argument happens all the time. Because the rugged Jeep CJ5 and the new Jeep CJ7, with extra room for gear and optional automatic transmission, makes four-wheeling nothing but pure fun. One more time! <laughs> Jeep CJ. We wrote the book on four-wheel drive. Take a look at someone who takes Geritol. I'm a single woman with a career that means a lot to me. I work hard, and I love it. And because I want to make as much of myself as I can, I try to do the right things to take good care of myself. And one thing I do is take Geritol every day. Geritol, to be sure you get enough iron and some very important vitamins. I have a positive attitude about my career and my life. And that's one reason why I take Geritol every day. The president held another of his regularly scheduled press conferences today, covering a lot of ground. He said he still feels optimistic over the prospects for his energy program despite setbacks so far in the Congress. He defended his U.N. ambassador, Andrew Young, again. And once more, he stubbornly defended his policy of speaking out on human rights. Marilyn Berger covered the press conference. President Carter used his press conference to make an unusual defense of Soviet human rights activist Anatoly Sharansky. The Soviet Union is reportedly preparing charges of treason against him for allegedly working with the CIA. Mr. Carter said the charges are not true. The president said he would continue to speak out on human rights. Our uh, statements concerning uh, human rights, I think, have been well received around the world. We've not singled out the Soviet Union for criticism. And I've never tried to inject myself into the internal affairs of the Soviet Union. If it hits ourselves as self-criticism, so be it. If it touches the Soviet Union and they interpret it as intrusion, so be it. Mr. Carter also used his press conference to defend his outspoken U.N. ambassador, Andrew Young, who has recently said that several former American presidents are racists. I think that Andy Young has been a superb representative of our country. And I think that, that his use of the word racism has clouded the issue and has brought perhaps uh, undeserved criticism on himself. I, I think that, that in general, what uh, Ambassador Young is accomplishing for us in dealing with third world nations, those who are struggling for recognition, those who are struggling against oppressive hunger and disease and poverty is very good. I think we have a new sense in the minds of those kinds of people, of caring about them. And to a major degree, it's because of that trust in Andy Young. Mr. Carter backed away from a confrontation with Congress over his energy program. Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd had criticized him for overreacting to defeats in some congressional committees last week, and he told him to cool it. Today, Mr. Carter seemed to be taking Senator Byrd's advice, saying he now had confidence in the sound judgment of Congress, that some of the setbacks would be reversed. But he warned that unless there's an adequate energy program, both he and Congress would be criticized by the American people. Marilyn Berger, NBC News, the White House. The president also said the next director of the FBI to succeed Clarence Kelly probably will be one of five people recommended to him by a screening committee. They are... U.S. Appeals Court Judge Harlington Wood, Jr. of Chicago, Neil Welsh, who runs the FBI's Philadelphia office, John Vandekamp, who is Los Angeles County District Attorney, William Lucas, who is the Sheriff of Wayne County in Michigan, and John Irwin, Jr., who is Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court. Tom Clark, a Supreme Court Justice for 18 years, died in his sleep today at the home of his son, Ramsey Clark, in New York City. He was 77. Edwin Newman was with Tom Clark only yesterday. Edwin? Well, I was with Tom Clark yesterday evening. We happened to be on the same flight from Washington to New York, and we shared a taxi from the airport. We had an adventurous driver who made me nervous. And Clark's advice was simple. Don't look. He was on his way to hear a case, and he had a big batch of briefs. He told me he'd been balled out for carrying luggage at his age, but he didn't think it would do him any harm. For years, Clark has been sitting as a judge in districts where there's a big backlog. He also headed the Federal Judicial Center, which tries to improve the court system. Chief Justice Warren Berger had this comment on that work today. I think it is fair to say that no single person in the last 30 years has contributed more to the improvement of justice in this country than Tom Clark. 
Clark went to Washington from Texas in 1936. As an assistant attorney general, he directed the roundup and internment of Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor, something he came later to believe was a dreadful wrong. Harry Truman made Clark the attorney general and then appointed him to the Supreme Court in 1949. He served there for 18 years. One decision he wrote was that prayer could not be required in public schools. Clark retired from the court in 1967 when his son Ramsey became attorney general and he swore Ramsey in. I knew Tom Clark on and off for more than 30 years. He was always talkative and affable, but when he went on the bench, he bloomed. He was a happy judge. John? Thank you, Edwin. We'll have more news in a minute. The Distant Grass Year. What makes it better than any you've used before? The new Distin Power Pack that's rechargeable. Snap it in, go. Snap it out, charge. The Distin Grass Shear is completely cordless, so you can trim anywhere. Around rocks and trees, along driveways, wherever there's grass to trim. Get the Distin Power Pack Grass Shear today. Distin, we help you get it done. We buy thousands of vacuums every year, and we know which ones are made to last. Our first choice, Hoover. Look, this is the only kind of agitator Hoover makes. It's steel, not wood or plastic. It's what gives you Hoover's deep down cleaning action. Every one of these Hoovers has it. Celebrity 2, power drive, convertible, even this new quick broom. You want a vacuum that's made to last? Get a Hoover. Insist on Hoover, the number one name in vacuum cleaners. Tomorrow, more than a quarter of a million union coal miners will vote for a new president. They will be voting at a time when their union, the United Mine Workers, is at a crossroads in its long history. Our special report this evening deals with that crossroads and the direction the union could take. Here is Bob Kerr. The union Henry Moore belongs to, the United Mine Workers, is mining only 54% of this country's coal. That's much less than it used to mine. Unauthorized strikes, absenteeism, and other problems are tearing Moore's union apart, threatening its bargaining strength and contract negotiations. That's why a quarter of a million United Mine Workers of America believe tomorrow's election is the most important one in the union's 88-year history. But strong leadership and a strong coal miners' union are not important to miners alone. They are important to President Carter, whose energy program depends on increased coal production important to people who make steel, people who'd be out of work without coal to heat their ovens, important to people who buy things made of steel, which would cost more if a long coal strike crippled the steel mills, and important to people who pay electric bills, which would be higher if coal got scarce. So tomorrow's election comes at a time when nearly all of us rely on the strength of the United Mine Workers Union. Its members say the trouble is the union is weak. One time, I figured we had uh, a good union, and uh, everybody just, uh, some, so many crooked things, so many things went going, everybody lost interest, and they just got to where they won't go to the union hall, they won't do anything to help their own self, really. The Mine Workers Union cannot recruit new members in some places because non-union companies pay more. Members complain that their contract is not enforced and that weak leadership permits unauthorized wildcat strikes that cause local unions to go broke and cause miners to lose faith in their national officers. Any time you see them guys is the day election time. They come around, they want to get nominated and get in office, then when they're in office, they forget about you. I think it's about time they get out in the coal fields, get the hell out of them office down there in Washington, get the hell out here with the men and see what's going on. Arnold Miller is running for re-election as Mine Workers Union president. Miller, once a miner himself, was elected five years ago to bring democracy to the union. His administration got rid of chauffeured limousines that used to take top union officials around Washington and got rid of the corruption that riddled the administration of his predecessor, Tony Boyle. Beginning with John L. Lewis, who made the UMW strong, the union's tradition was dictatorship. So when democracy finally came to the Union in 1972, it was new and difficult to handle. Some in the Union believed democracy caused the dissension and political squabbling that weakened the Union. 
Mine workers President Miller, who says he's come to enjoy politics and benefits like this Washington fundraiser, says he deserves more time to make democracy work. But Harry Patrick, a former miner from West Virginia who used to support Miller, says Miller's had enough time. Patrick, the union secretary treasurer, is campaigning hard to take the presidency away from his former friend. The other candidate is Lee Roy Patterson, now a mine workers union executive board member, once an ally of Tony Boyle. Patterson has lost support by accepting campaign contributions from officers of the steel workers union and by saying he'd consider merging the mine workers and steel workers, an unpopular proposal among miners. President Miller says his polls show him far ahead, but judging by the mood of the miners, an upset is possible. If the United Mine Workers were as strong, as unified, and as productive as they used to be, this would be just another union election. But the fact is the union is divided, and productivity is way down, all at a time when coal production is crucial to meeting the nation's energy problem. So the Mine Workers president, elected tomorrow, faces an extraordinary challenge and responsibility. Bob Kerr, NBC News, Munson, West Virginia. The Amway story has many chapters. This is one of them. We felt trapped in a gray world. Dead end job, stuck at home. And then we discovered Amway. We started part time. We built an independent business. Helped others start Amway businesses too. We're building it our way and that gives us a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment. We're living again. With Amway, you could make it happen. See your Amway distributor. And get the whole story. Terrific coffee. <laughs> but I can't drink this. Yes, you can. No, I can't. I want the caffeinated. Yes, you can. It's brim decaffeinated. Uh, uh, no, I can't. This tastes too good to be decaffeinated. Well, you can get good taste in decaffeinated coffee with brim. Just taste its rich ground flavor. Brim is delicious. Can I have another cup? No, you can't. You'll miss your train. Brim tastes like fresh ground coffee. It tastes so good, you won't believe it's decaffeinated. I'm showing Carol how to save money with unsweetened Kool-Aid and sugar. Just like my mom showed me. I remember how we mixed Kool-Aid. Mom said it was so inexpensive. I thought it was so delicious. It's still delicious. And today, with my sugar, it's only about 12 cents a quart. It has vitamin C, too. When I'm a mommy, I'm going to make it for my kids. Kool-Aid brand soft drink mix and your sugar. You loved it as a kid, you trust it as a mother. The Chrysler Corporation, under some pressure from the Securities and Exchange Commission, admitted today that some of its foreign subsidiaries had made what Chrysler called unusual payments. The unusual payments said the company averaged almost half a million dollars a year from 1970 through 1976. Some of that money went to foreign government employees. Near the center of Johannesburg, South Africa today, two white men were killed and another was wounded by black gunmen. The government says there is no doubt the attackers were terrorists. Two arrests have been made. This was the first urban guerrilla attack this year in South Africa. In Holland, the South Moluccan sieges are over, but their effects are still being felt. John Palmer reports. It was exactly three weeks ago that South Moluccan terrorists seized the town's grammar school and hijacked the train. But the problems here did not end with the dramatic rescue of the hostages by Dutch Marines. The killing of six of the terrorists has embittered the South Moluccan community and has deepened the distrust between them and their Dutch neighbors. Just two miles outside of town, Dutch police were practicing on a rifle range today. The sound of gunfire could be heard in the distance and it did nothing to calm jittery nerves. This morning, Dutch parents removed their children from a school near the South Moluccan neighborhood in Bovenschmilde. They said the two policemen posted at the entrance did not provide enough security. Many of these children were among the 105 youngsters held hostage for a week in the other school just two blocks away. One of the parents said they took our children before and they could do it again unless we are better protected. As further evidence of the strain in relations between the two communities, three people were seriously injured in a tavern brawl between South Moluccans and Dutchmen. The situation has become so tense that most all contact between the two communities has been suspended. Late this afternoon in the nearby town of Assen, delegations of South Moluccans from all over Holland gathered at a church 
for a memorial service for the six terrorists killed by Dutch Marines when they stormed the train early Saturday morning. The mood was a mixture of anger and sadness. The dead included the 25-year-old leader of the terrorists, a woman member of the group, and four other gunmen. They will be buried tomorrow in the town's public cemetery. Police have been placed on alert in case of trouble. Private services for the two Dutch hostages who also died in the train attack will be held in their hometowns not far from here. John Palmer, NBC News, in Northern Holland. In two days, the Spanish people will vote in the first free elections held since 1936. Today, a wave of bombing took place from the northern Basque provinces to the Mediterranean coast. Police said extremists were trying to sabotage the elections. As another gesture in the development of closer Cuban-American relations, ten Americans have been released from Cuban jails and flown to Mexico City. And in a new book about J. Paul Getty, written by a longtime legal advisor, the book says that the billionaire liked to think that he may have been the reincarnation of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, and that he tried to emulate the emperor closely. This is ridiculous. A grown man tying a ribbon around his finger to remember something. Your vitamins. That's it. Hey, where are they? They're in your cereal. Product 19? If you want vitamins but forget, remember Kellogg's Product 19. One ounce has 100% of the U.S. recommended daily allowance of 10 essential vitamins and iron. Tastes good. I can remember that. Can I have my ribbon back? Vitamins that taste too good. Taste too good to forget. I think women are becoming a little more frightening to men these days. Maybe because we're freer to do much more. But some men aren't intimidated at all. They enjoy our freedom. Those are the men I like. And you know, those are the men who wear English leather cologne. English leather fits the way they live. It's so clean and natural, and I love it. So all my men wear English leather, but they wear nothing at all. Look for English leather in a wide selection of gift sets. President Carter has approved a plan for very inexpensive flights between New York City and London. Flights which could greatly increase the number of people flying the Atlantic. The proposal approved by the president allows a British firm, Laker Airways, to charge $135 for a one-way, no-frills trip and $236 for a round trip. The cheapest non-charter fare now is $440 round trip. Administration officials said today that the Lockheed Shipbuilding and Construction Company, part of Lockheed Aircraft, charged the government for 73 million pounds of steel, which was not used in ships Lockheed was building for the Navy. The government doesn't know where all that unused steel went. It was reported from Washington today that the administration has decided to give its approval for construction of a nuclear plant at Seabrook, New Hampshire. Not long ago, 1,400 people were arrested there for demonstrating against construction on the grounds that the plant would hurt the environment. And finally this evening, if you don't know what a hundred-year-old Wookiee is, he or it is seen here on the left, chances are you're going to find out. Douglas Kiker reports. Star Wars. It is more than just a successful movie, it is a box office phenomenon. The film is breaking attendance records all over the country. Not since Jaws have so many people stood in line to see a movie. Alan Ladd Jr., an executive at 20th Century Fox, whose film it is, talked about the reasons for its appeal. I think it's just Good and evil, the simplicity of the, the whole story is what really makes it work. Uh, it's a fantasy, and uh, I think we all grew up in a fantasy world, and I think that, that it works on that level. Star Wars cost $9 million to produce. It will bring in at least 10 times that amount. As a result, the price of 20th Century Fox stock has doubled in the last two weeks. There are no sex scenes in Star Wars. Unlike Jaws, it doesn't frighten people. It's just an old-fashioned cowboy movie set in space with mind-boggling special effects. 
In the classic westerns, it's the good guys versus the bad guys, sometimes a pair of good guys, one experienced and a little cynical, the other a tenderfoot, a kid. In Star Wars, their names are Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. The bad guys always are a rough, tough, sinister-looking bunch. And never more so than in Star Wars. The damsel in distress. That's Princess Leia, who is held captive by the bad guys. Sometimes the good guys have a sidekick who provides the comic relief. Come on. In Star Wars, the sidekicks are two robots. And Chewbacca, who somehow knows how to pilot a spaceship. The climax of every good cowboy movie is the final showdown between the good guys and the bad guys. The only difference in Star Wars is that the characters ride spaceships instead of horses. I'll be right there. A cowboy movie set in space, that's Star Wars. It's old-fashioned, escapist entertainment, pure and simple, with no moral, no message. And it appears this is what just about everybody in the country is in the mood for. Douglas Kiker, NBC News, Washington. And that's it for this evening. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, good night for NBC News. These Atlas tires look identical. They both meet federal standards for strength and endurance, but we're removing our name from this one. Why? Because it's not good enough to meet additional Atlas standards for smooth ride and long-term reliability. In fact, these Atlas standards are among the highest in the tire industry. So when you see the name Atlas on tires, you can be sure they're top quality, and that means real value. Look for them at a service station in your neighborhood. Long mileage Atlas tires. Am I lucky? I have a normal, healthy American family. There they are. When we have a health problem, like occasional constipation, we like to do something about it. We take something gentle, X-Lax. We know it's safe. We take it just the way it says to. We learned years ago that X-Lax works gently. So when we need it, we take X-Lax. Don't you? Dependable X-Lax, the laxative medicine. There came the day when Bernard Stroh was ready. And he would spend his time learning the trade from his father, as his father had learned it from his father before. Everything the Stroh family has learned about brewing in two centuries has gone into this glass of beer. It's something the real beer lover will appreciate. I don't like brand.